Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome science writer David W. Brown to the show. He is a contributor for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Scientific American. We will discuss his new book, The Mission, telling the story of NASA's upcoming project, the Europa Clipper. But first, we kick off the Fortnite of Mars as the first two of three new spacecraft arrive at our planetary neighbor, readying to explore the Red Planet. We're also going to head out to the outer reaches of our planetary family, where we meet far, far out, the most distant object known in our solar system. This week kicked off two weeks of new spacecraft arriving at Mars. The first of these, the Hope Orbiter, arrived at the Red Planet on Tuesday, February 9th. This spacecraft, the first from an Arab nation to reach another world, will study the atmosphere of Mars, gathering clues to weather and climatic conditions on that ruddy world. The following day, on February 10th, the Tianwen-1 mission successfully reached orbit over Mars, readying for its own study of the Red Planet. This first Chinese mission to Mars includes an orbiter, lander, and rover. The lander is expected to touch down on Utopia Planitia, where the Viking landers touched foot on in the 1970s. The rover and lander will then explore the geology and chemistry of the Martian surface searching for signs of Martian water. In the distant reaches of our solar system, a tiny world, roughly 400 kilometers or 250 miles across, orbits the sun once every thousand years. A team of astronomers from around the United States recently analyzed this distant body aptly named Far, Far Out. They found this dwarf planet currently sits 132 times further from the Sun than we do here on Earth. However, it follows a highly elliptical orbit, traveling between 27 and 175 times the Earth-Sun distance. This makes far out the most far far out the most distant known body in the solar system. And that's really far out. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will one day end. Meanwhile, stars Planets and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, we're joined by acclaimed science writer David W. Brown. He has recently written a new book, The Mission, telling the story of NASA's upcoming Europa Clipper to the Jovian system. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we talk to David W. Brown. He is an author and a journalist who has been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Scientific American. He has a new book called The Mission, and I'm going to leave the subtitle up to 
<laughs> to you. Um, and it talks about the uh, Europa Clipper mission and program. So we'd like to uh, welcome you to the show, David. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So um, one of the things I really enjoyed about your book is that it's told through the eyes of the people who helped develop this program and in ways that kind of reminded me of Radium Girls, which is which <laughs> I really enjoyed. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the people that you talk about in the book and what, what they brought to the program? Of course. Uh, when I started writing the book, um, I didn't realize just how big the cast of characters would be, nor did I realize how sprawling the story would turn out. Um, the first, um, the, I, how can I say this? Uh, over the course of the book, I, inter I ended up interviewing over, over 100 people um, across the country and, and really to some extent around the world. Um, it was, um, and this is everyone from graduate student all the way to the administrator of NASA. One of the things when I first began writing the story, the very first interview I went into seven years ago, five minutes into the interview, I thought I had a good grip on things and I realized very quickly, I don't know anything about this subject. Like it, 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 it struck me in a, in a moment of horror, but that was also a liberating moment because at that moment I realized I can go into this thing with no preconceived notions. I can take a beginner's mind to the project. And uh, accordingly, I was able to sort of experience the, the horrors that these people went through, the dread, the suspense, the wonder, the awe, the ups and the downs. And, um, Whenever I would interview somebody, I would always try to figure out who is the person who could tell me the whys of what happened to this person. Like, why did somebody say no? And then I would go to the person who said no and say, well, why'd you do that? And I would go higher and higher, sort of up the food chain, until ultimately I was able to get a holistic view of this program. And um, really, I met some of the most extraordinary human beings in the world. It was just the experience of a lifetime. Wow. So, you know, you mentioned, you know, Tiki, you did seven years worth of research and interviews for this book. So, I mean, this is quite a project. I mean, that takes up a good portion of your life. What inspired it? Why did you write it? Well, as a storyteller, you're always on the lookout for stories with big stakes, right? You want high stakes in your story and you want interesting characters. Um, I can't think of any stakes higher than the notion of of life on another world or in our solar system. What makes Europa particularly interesting? So for those who don't know, of course, Europa is on your background. Uh, Europa is an ocean world. Um, it's surrounded by a thick ice shell, uh, several kilometers thick. Um, it's about the size of our moon, but there's three times more liquid salt water on Europa than there is on the planet Earth. Um, so it's a true ocean world. And at the bottom of that ocean, water touches rock. Uh, what all this means in practice is Everything you need for life to have taken hold in this world is there. So if we find life on Mars, you know, in the years ahead, as Perseverance collects samples um, in the coming days, and uh, those samples eventually find their way back to labs on Earth, um, life or evidence of previous life, um, there's a good chance that life is probably related to life on Earth. Um, over the, because of the asteroid impacts over the years, the things that killed dinosaurs, Earth is kicked up into space, our planets are always orbiting, and they're always intersecting. But that probably would not have happened with Europa. Jupiter's just too far out, and Europa's just too darn weird for that to have really been a, been a uh, physical possibility, which means Europa experienced a second genesis. Um, so all life on Earth comes from a single origin. Whatever's on Europa, that had its own beginning. And so there are some interesting philosophical questions and religious questions and, and of course, scientific questions. It'll rewrite the book on biology. What, and what stakes could be higher than that? And, and of course, what story, who would not want to tell that story? Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, while, we, while we're at this wonderful little intersection of science and philosophy and um, what, you know, at the end of 2000, uh, the 2010 or you know, Odyssey 2, as you mentioned, um, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, you know, spoiler alert, 
ends the book with <laughs> with a warning for us to stay away from Europa. You know, something along the lines of all these other worlds are yours, make make no landings here. Right. Um, can you tell us, you know, what what do you expect to find at Europa and what's it, so that's 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 the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, if we look at the bottom of our own ocean floor, you're going to find things very similar to what is expected to be at the bottom of Europa's ocean floor. Um, there should be what are called hydrothermal vents down there. These are these columns of hot water and nutrients blasting into that ocean. Um, and water touches rock, which means you get interesting chemistry. Uh, the bottom of our ocean floor is very similar in that regard. And we know from the hydrothermal vents down there um, life teams there. I mean, it, it's the, the ocean floor is way more alive than we would have expected. Um, consequently, um, Europa's, and if we look at the animals in our own world, um, the ocean has some pretty alien looking things already. When we look at ocean, Europa's ocean, there's no sunlight, so there would be no photosynthesis. Um, you know, they're, they're, for, for many years, science fiction, a staple of it were like these saucer-eyed fish because there's no sunlight, but they might not even have eyes. Um, and um, one interesting thing that I will say, um, on Earth, we've experienced multiple extinction-level events um, over the course of the, you know, the history of the planet. The, the globe has been sterilized more than once. And of course, you can ask, again, you can ask the dinosaurs how they feel about this. But, but before <laughs> then, I mean, the Earth was just wiped clean. Uh, Europa has had an ocean for about 4 billion years. Um, in that time, it's very likely that they haven't had those extinction level events. So if life did take hold a long time ago, and if in fact life takes about 500 million years to establish itself on a planet, that means that conceivably, whatever's down there, if life took hold, could be very evolved. It could be quite evolved and, and as such, I, I don't think we even have a context for what that would mean. I mean, that's, we're talking about true alien life. And I'm, you know, I'm not talking about ET, but I am talking about when we look at our own, you know, the, the food chain on earth, right? If I go to a restaurant and eat a fish, um, I can eat that fish morally with moral justification because some hominid a million years ago established my place on the pecking order but if this life on europa is unrelated to earth and this fish is there do i have any what, what, how, do, how does how does humankind even relate to that sort of that sort of life not in a interactive sort of way but in a conceptual way um there are some those are some cool philosophical questions to ask is that even an animal like what would you call it um, right. And those are questions that are going to be answered in our lifetime. All right. It reminds me of, you know, one of the first episodes of uh, the original Star Trek series mm -hmm. with the Horta, who was, you know, this oh. rock being that was, you know, That's right. attacking miners and they couldn't figure out, you know, why it turns out, spoiler alert, <laughs> it was just a mother living rock creature protecting its kids. So, you know, that's going to be some... It's, it's, it's going to be a whole new branch of, you know, exo philosophy. And I mean, and, and that's, again, that's why, that's why I wrote the mission. I mean, that's why I was so driven to write it. And certainly once I started writing it, it's why I was so excited to, uh, why, really why I was willing to invest so much of my life into it, because this is, these are the sorts of questions that have to be faced forthrightly, um, and have to be taken seriously, and uh, they deserve to be written about with respect and uh, with a certain uh, thoroughness and, um, I would say, uh, responsibility. Hmm. And you know, your book talks about um, is you know talks about how this project is, is being developed, is being developed by all these different forces pulling in different directions. You had you know, astronomers and planetary scientists and budget people and congressmen and, you know, so I guess I, I'd like your opinion on whether, you know, that sort of committee, if you will, you know, decision is good for science? Does it help? Does it help us develop us, you know, a better mission, better missions all in all? Or does it create a camel designed by committee? Well, th there can be some of that. I would say overall, 
Um, so NASA doesn't, for people who don't really follow this sort of thing, this is maybe a little inside baseball, but NASA doesn't work like the Pentagon, right? So if the, if the Department of Defense decides we want to send a carrier group to the Pacific, whatever, they just order the carrier group to go there. But NASA doesn't work like that. For these sorts of missions, um, planetary scientists have to build a consensus within their own community. They have to, so there has to be scientific support. Planetary scientists have to build sort of a constituency uh, at NASA headquarters. The, the, the powers that be, the people who are writing the checks, have to believe the mission that you have developed is technically feasible. Um, it does not it is not excessive in risk. In other words, the spacecraft's not going to get there and blow up, um, and uh, is going to achieve a level of science worth the investment. So here's the problem. Here's why things are so complicated. NASA doesn't have a lot of money. Like when we talk about percentages of the federal budget, people think 30% of the federal budget, 40%, because because the things the space program does are so astonishing in achievement and in scope. NASA gets one half of 1% of the federal budget. And of that, only a quarter goes toward this sort of robotic exploration. So, I mean, Americans spend more every year on chewable dog toys than they do on this sort of, you know, to explore Pluto and to explore Europa and to explore Mars, all of those things, squeaky dog toys, right? <laughs> so when you have that little money and that much responsibility, literally the entire universe, um, what you're going to end up with is, uh, is a highly competitive environment. Is it the best way to do it? Probably not. But given the resources, it's, it's probably the only way that it can be done. Mm. And do you think that has anything to do with the amount of support that the space program gets in this country versus, you know, perhaps other nations. I mean, the UAE just, you know, just uh, sent its first, or, you know, the first Mars spacecraft from the UAE just arrived at the That's Red right. Planet. Right. And they Outside. lit up all of their, you know, public locations, all their historic sites with red lights. The government came out with, you know, a, congratulatory messages before hope ever arrived at Mars. Um, I think, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I would say that, first of all, that's an astounding achievement. And, and I'm so glad, I, I was so happy to see it. I was so happy to see those smiles on their face. What a technical achievement. It speaks a lot to space as a, um, as a unifying force for good, right? We're not detonating nuclear bombs. We're building these things, you know, that can explore other worlds. Um, in the case of, you know, public support in the United States, you know, in, in, a, in, in less in in eight days or depending on when the viewers watching this on February 18th, um, right. the Perseverance rover is going to land on Mars. Right. And, you know, we're landing a, a one ton nuclear powered car on another planet. Like cool. you're going to see that similar level of of. Um, of celebration, I think, because yeah. every time we do the impossible, the JPL's motto is Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They're the ones who built it. Their motto is Bear Mighty Things. And here <laughs> they are doing it once again. Um, you know, we'll, in a time of COVID, it's hard to beat the drum quite as hard as you might otherwise have. I know when the Curiosity rover landed, Times Square was filled and they broadcast it on, on those giant screens. We won't have that this time. But I do think, and I think in the heart of every uh, of every human being, seeing this sort of thing, you know deep down uh, this matters, right? Every Mars mission is a human precursor mission. We're right behind them. And uh, I, I, I do think that causes a stirring uh, deep inside of someone. So I, I do hope that the, the space program see, continues seeing the level of support that it's sort of picked up lately. But you also have to remember it's never been that popular. If we look back to the Apollo program, this wasn't like a 100% supported thing. A minority right. of people supported this space program. Right. So it's never going to be the sort of thing where people are dancing in the streets over. But but I do think it's the sort of thing where people are beginning to realize the scientific value of it. Hmm. And how do you think that um, space exploration, especially you know within NASA and SpaceX, is going to change over the next few years, particularly with the incoming Biden administration? We're sort of in a waiting pattern right now. I think once we once the, the NASA administrator is nominated, we're going to have a much clearer picture of that. 
My suspicion is they've already suggested that they're going to continue the Artemis program. My personal hope is that they continue the Artemis program's ultimate goal, which is to put people on Mars. I consider the moon to be an unnecessary pit stop along the way. Um, but, you know, a lot of people disagree with that. Um, if they continue the Artemis program, that probably means NASA will continue at its current funding level. Uh, NASA is also in a good position in terms of missions that are about to launch or land. So uh, the Perseverance rover, for example, it, it was an expensive endeavor. And now the expensive part is over. Um, the James Webb Space Telescope has been a perennial kind of drag on the science budget. Well, that's going to launch this year. So that 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 expense is going to be taken off the books. Um, likewise, Europa Clipper is, is going to enter development. So its its development costs are going to be peaking soon, and then it's going to cost a lot less going forward, um, which means there are some great opportunities in the next decade um, in terms of where we go, what big, mes- big missions we send. Do we send a Europa lander to scrape around in that, you know, saw into that ice and see if it can find evidence of things that once wiggled? Are we going to send a sample return collection mission to launch it back to Earth? Are we going to send missions to the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune? Are we going to send a Pluto ship out? I mean, the sky's the limit. We're living in the golden age of space exploration. We can do anything. We're sending a, a quadcopter like the drones right. you would fly in the park. We're sending that to Titan. I mean, this, this is, we're living in, in a science fiction golden age, but it's yeah. real. Yeah, we, we have a helicopter going landing on Mars with that's right, that's you right know, ingenuity. Um, it's just it's just absolutely incredible. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, David. It was great talking with you. Thank you very much. It, it was a real treat. Thanks, and that was uh, David W. Brown, and he is the author of the mission. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we talk with Dr. Fatima Abrahimi from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. We'll discuss her work designing a new plasma engine capable of bringing spacecraft and people to Mars and beyond. And on March 16th, we're going to be joined by the world's best-known astrophysicist, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Subscribe or follow today and never miss an episode. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. And we depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.